Hitler bathed four times a day. And he was also an admirer of willpower, so he could stand like this for eight hours in the back of a car. And the thing about conscientious people is they're very willpower oriented. You think about the Nazis and their goose stepping. And what's happening is that every single person in the military becomes an identical unit, right? A uni they're all uniform. And they're all, in some sense, imitating the, the dictator in, in an absolutely perfect way. And so the dictator wants to impose strict uniformity on the entire population. That's order. Order. And one of the things we've discovered that's really interesting is that um, disgust sensitivity is associated with orderliness. And, and that's associated with conscientiousness. And one of the things about Hitler was that he was very disgust sensitive. And a lot of his hatred for non-Aryans so imagine inside the Aryan box, it was all uniform. Outside, it was all parasites and predators. And so, and that was a manifestation of disgust, not of fear. It's a whole different thing. And if you read Hitler's Table Talk, which is a collection of his spontaneous dinner speeches from 1939 to 1942, it's a very interesting book. You see that his metaphor for the Aryan race was a body, a pure body unassaulted by parasites or predators, and that he was trying to er erect a border around it to keep all of that away. So it's an immunological disgust-like metaphor. And there's some recent work that was published in PLOS One about three years ago, showing that brilliant study, should have got much more attention, showing that if you went around and, and, and sampled political attitudes in different countries, or even within the same country, what you found was that the higher the prevalence of infectious diseases, the higher the probability of totalitarian political attitudes at the local level. And you can imagine, well, what happens if there's infectious diseases is you want to put borders around everything. You don't want free movement between ideas or people because that's partly how the disease spreads. You're going to have much more strict sexual rules, for example, because that's a great way for diseases to be transmitted. And before Hitler went on his rampage against the non-Aryans, he cleaned up all the factories. Like he went in there and fumigated them, it was part of the law. And he went on a public health campaign to get rid of tuberculosis and he got rid of the bugs in the factories as well. And he used Zyklon B. That's an insecticide and that's the gas that he used in the gas chambers eventually. So first it was the bugs in the rats and then it was people who were, then it was euthanasia. That was the next move and forced euthanasia. And the, the rationale for that was compassion, by the way, just so you all know. It's, it's, it's merciful to put these people who are burdensome to themselves and their families and the state who are living second-rate lives, it's merciful to euthanize them. And that was a huge campaign in Germany. It was after that that the, the more racial purifications began. And so that's the disgust thing. That's unbelievably important. It's... it's, it's because lots of times people think that conservatives are more anxiety sensitive than liberals and that's why they're closed in terms of their ideas but that doesn't look right first of all conservatives are less neurotic than liberals although the effect isn't that big so it doesn't look and they actually are they they score higher in, in measures of well-being the most unhappy people are liberal men by the way so but you know people are often accused if they're conservative of being fearful and that's why they you know suppress other people's viewpoints, but that doesn't look right. It's low openness and high orderliness, and that looks like it's associated with disgust, and that looks like it's associated with something called the extended immune system, which is the proclivity of people to, to keep themselves away from potential sources of contamination. It's really terrifying, because one of the things people often said about Germany was that, you know, it was a very civilized country, and yet it descended into barbarity. But conscientiousness is a very good predictor of long-term success. And so you could say, well, conscientious societies are more civilized, but they're also more orderly, and that makes them more disgust-sensitive. And so what it might have, easily, might have easily been in Germany was that it was an excess of civilization rather than its lack that produced exactly these consequences. And that's a far more frightening proposition, and one that's, I believe, much more likely to be true. Hitler bathed four times a day. And he was also an admirer of willpower, so he could stand like this for eight hours in the back of a car. And the thing about conscientious people is they're very willpower oriented. And so if you're unfortunate enough to be sick, chronically, in the house of someone who's conscientious, especially if it's a mental illness, you're more likely to relapse because 
the conscientious person is going to be judgmental and they're going to say to you, if you're schizophrenic, they're going to say, well, if you just organize yourself and get up in the morning and try a little harder, you could overcome this, which is of course true, except you can't because you're schizophrenic. And so the pressure put on you by the anger and the contempt is going to increase the probability that you'll relapse. So orderly people are very judgmental. And you know, orderliness is, a, is very highly associated with things like anorexia. And the anorexic is basically someone who's so disgust sensitive that they become unable to tolerate their own body. And they see it as a source of corruption and imperfection, which of course is exactly right. It is. And it's a very difficult thing to maintain order around. There's a book called Ordinary Men that's a lot like that. I don't think I've mentioned that to you before, but Ordinary Men is a book about, it's the best book of its type, it's, it's, maybe it's the only book of its type. It's possible, but it's plotted much like Breaking Bad in some sense. It's a story about these German policemen in er early stages of World War II. And they were guys who were old enough to be raised in Germany really before the Hitlerian propaganda came out in full force. You know, if you were a teenager, say, in the 1930s, you were going to be pulled right into the propaganda machine and maybe you were part of the Hitler Youth and, like, you were raised in that, you know. But if you were older, then you were raised before that and you're not as amenable to propaganda once you're older than about, well, I would say about 22 or something like that. It's, it's, it's pretty young, actually. If you're going to make a soldier, you have to get a soldier young, because once people are in their early 20s, say, they're kind of, they already have their personality developed. Anyways, these policemen were sent into Poland after the Germans marched through. And, uh, you know, it, it was wartime, and there was this hypothesis in Germany that the Jews in particular were operating as a fifth column and undermining the German war effort, because of course the Germans blamed the Jews and a variety of other people for actually setting up the conditions that made the war necessary. And so when the police were sent into Poland, they were also required to make peace, roughly speaking, and so they started, up by, they started out by rounding up all the Jewish men between 18 and 65 and gathering them in, in stadiums and then shipping them off on the trains, but that isn't where they ended. They ended in, in a very, very dark place. I mean, these guys were going out in the field with naked pregnant women and shooting them in the back of the head by the end of their training. And what's really interesting about that is that, uh, is that their commander told them that they could go home at any time. So this is, this is not one of those examples of people following orders. And the reason they didn't, roughly speaking, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons they didn't is because they didn't think it was comradely, so to speak, to leave their, the guys they were working with to do all the dirty work and run off. You know, and that's really, in, that's really an interesting fact, you know, because you'd, in, in different circumstances, you wouldn't think about that as reprehensible, right? You'd think, well, that's part of teamwork. And you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory, and then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. And we assume that Hitler wanted to win, but that's not a very intelligent assumption. Why would you assume that? He wasn't exactly a good guy, so why should we assume that he was aiming at the good that he was promoting, even in his own terms, right? The glorious, everlasting, Fourth, Third Reich, right? That'll rule for a thousand years and be a, a bastion of civilization and music because that's the sort of thing he purported to be interested in. Well, so what do you do with the Jews and the Gypsies? Well, round them up, fine. Enslave them, fine. You don't kill them. You certainly don't devote a substantial proportion of your war resources while you're losing to accelerate the rate at which the extermination is taking place. Because that's a bit counterproductive, unless what you're aiming at is the maximum possible mayhem in the shortest period of time. Well, so what happened as the Germans started to lose the war? Did Hitler lose faith in his own ability? No, he believed that the Germans had betrayed him with weakness. And so he was perfectly willing to ex accelerate the rate at which Germany was losing the war. And so when Hitler and his minions had the choice, here's the choice. You can suspend your unnecessary demolition of people, win the damn war, and then pick it up afterwards, or while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem even though it's counterproductive. It's like, what'd they pick? Well, they pick to accelerate the mayhem. And so to me, there's an old psychoanalytic idea. I think this was derived by Jung. If you can't figure out what someone is doing or why, look at the outcome. 
and infer the motivation. If it produces mayhem, perhaps it was aiming at mayhem. Now, you know, you have to use that dictum carefully. If someone's irritating you, you know, maybe it's because you're irritable and you should sort yourself out, but maybe it's because they're actually aiming at irritating you. And that's the actual motivation. So, perhaps not, but it's another tool in your analytical armament. So, <clears throat> and so you see, well, and this is the thing about warfare that's so interesting about, about because you, you, can, you can attribute it to territoriality. You can attribute it to a war for resources. That's what the, I would say, wretchedly simple-minded economists presume people fight over scarce resources. It's like, hey, we're a little bit more sophisticated than that. And first of all, what resources are you talking about? The bloody Inuit had nothing. They lived perfectly well. What did they have? Snow and seal blubber. You know, people can live in unbelievably deprived conditions. And so, the idea that there are natural resources that we fight over because there's a shortage of them is a pretty oversimplified view of human beings. It's like, well, why do people fight? Well, maybe they fight sometimes for good reasons. But very, very frequently, they fight for bad reasons. And those bad reasons are, are personal, as well as sociocultural and economic. You know, if you were a Nazi prison guard, for example, whatever pathologies you were carrying around in your destructive little soul, whatever element of Cain was deeply embedded in you, had the opportunity to be manifest fully at every moment of your waking existence, right? You had these people who were completely beholden to you, with no rights whatsoever, to whom you could do whatever your evil little heart determined. Think, well, maybe that was a motivation for putting them there to begin with. And all the cover story about, well, we're trying to build the Third Reich, and we're trying to stabilize the state, and we're trying to do all these good things. Maybe that's just a cover story for the real motivation, which is nothing but, but what? The construction of death camps that killed six million people. How about that? And the obliteration of 120 million people on the planet. And the, and the, and the, and the leaving of Europe in ruins. To be good, truly good, you can't just follow rules, that's, that's very clear in, in the Harry Potter story. And you also have to be able to understand malevolence. And in order to understand malevolence so that you can withstand it, you have to understand that part of you that's malevolent. Because if you don't, you're naive. And if you're naive, you're easy pickings. And so, that's a Jungian idea too, and the Jungian idea is that part of personality development is to understand your shadow. And the shadow is those things about you that you do not want to admit to. And you can learn about your shadow by reading history. You know, you can read about Auschwitz. You can read about the concentration camps in Russia. And you can imagine yourself as a guard instead of as a heroic rescuer of unfortunate victims, which would be very, very unlikely. And once you can imagine yourself as a guard, which is a terrifying thing to do, then you understand something about yourself. And I actually think, and I think this is also from student studying Jung, that you cannot have proper respect for yourself until you know that you're a monster. Because you won't act carefully enough. You know, if you think, well, I'm a nice person, I'd never do anyone any harm. It's like, you're no saint. You can be sure of that. And the harm that you do people can come in many, many ways. And so, if you regard yourself as harmless, inoffensive, nice, well, why do you have any reason to be careful? You're like a teddy bear sitting on a shelf. Even if you throw it at someone, no one's going to get hurt.